We're coming to you from the DraftKings.com podcasting studios. DraftKings.com, America's one-day fantasy sports site, where it's like a new season every time you play. DraftKings.com. From ESPN Pod Center, this is NBA Lockdown. Welcome into another edition of the NBA Lockdown Podcast. Alongside Amin al Hassan and Jeff Goodman, I'm George Sedano. It's a playoff preview, and we'll get into all the different matchups here. We'll talk about who's got the most favorable path to the finals, what's the series to watch, do we have any breakout players. We'll make our picks. We'll get into the MVP, and look, no offseason preview or postseason preview would not be uh, complete without some shuffling of the decks of the uh, coaches' chairs. So we'll get into some of that. As well, but guys, uh, you look at the way this thing has turned out now. Um, I think it's great for the league, and I've said this for months now that Anthony Davis is in the postseason. Whether he gets swept in four games or a gentleman sweep in five, I think it's a good thing for the league because I think eventually he becomes the guy who the torch gets passed to as the best player in the league. And I don't think enough of America has seen him, to be quite honest with you. I mean, what do you think? No, you're right. The uh, I think he's still not a household name, as shocking as they may be. But uh, they're about to find out because I think he's a tremendous player and a tremendous talent. Uh, I'll be honest. I don't know how much of the ball he's going to see. This is this is why I thought that Oklahoma City would make. A, I don't want to say formidable because it's not formidable. In, in the words of. And the words of uh, Clubber Lang in Rocky Three, I do not accept the challenge because there is no challenge. But I'd be happy to whoop his <laughs> on the ring for a couple of rounds. Like that's that's exactly what's going to happen here. You know, <laughs> this idea that like, oh, Oklahoma City could have given them a bigger challenge. There was no challenge either way. This is going to be an annihilation. But in the case of New Orleans, the bigger issue is their best player, the guy who can really do some damage. He needs the ball in his hands, and he doesn't have it. Right. So if you're if you're Anthony Davis. Your livelihood, so to speak, depends on can Tyree get me the ball? Can Drew get me the ball? Can Eric Gordon get me the ball? Uh, you know, that's and, and a team like Golden State, one of the things they really thrive on is they take what you want to do and they basically prevent you from even trying it. That's how good defensively they are. They, most times we talk about good defenses is they let you do what you want to do and then they contest the shot and grab the rebound. Wow, that was great defense. Golden State's like, no, no, you're just not even going to get to that point. Because before you even cross half court, we'll have harassed you. And if you try to get to the screen, we'll push you away from the screen. And if the screener comes through, we're going to trap. And like, they just, they do so many things to prevent basically you getting into what you want to get into that I, I don't know what kind of impact Davis will have. Not because he's not good, but because I don't know, you know, they'll just deny him the ball. Uh, Jeff, you, you know it's good though you, that you know that kid really well. So yeah. I mean, you 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 got an under. You, I would imagine you of all people really understand what this means to him. Well, I think it's just good. He's 22 years old and he's going to get one playoff series under his belt, and, and I think that's going to help him down the road. Are they going to win? No. Uh, can they win a game? Maybe. Uh, like I mean said, the problem is when you've got Tyreek and Eric Gordon, those guys aren't looking to pass. Those guys are looking to get buckets. And Drew Holiday's, you know, he's a good point guard, but he's not an elite point guard by any means. So uh, I think this team almost has to change in the future uh, for Anthony Davis to be able to be featured like he should be as he kind of grows when he's already pretty much there, uh, one of the top three, four, five players, whatever you want to rank him right now. Uh, but, I, again, I just think it's going to be good for him to get his feet wet in the playoffs and, It'll be interesting because the country will get to see Anthony Davis uh, on a big stage against, you know, the best team, I guess, in the NBA right now. I Jeff, mean, let me ask you a question. Hold on. Let me, let me sorry, ask ahead. Jeff a question because you've been around Anthony Davis. Well. Do you think he has it in him? And, and this isn't a knock. I just, it's a personality trait. Does he have the, the hey, mf -er, get me the effing ball in him? And I'm not saying right now, but is, is that gene in him? Do you think he, or is he kind of like the, I don't want to say gentle giant, but kind of like the Tim Duncan mold, lead by example, you know, trust in my teammates and my coaches to get me the ball? What do you consider Kevin Durant personality-wise? 
I think uh, he's the, grown into the, the, the former. I consider him the former, not I, really? or, excuse me, the Duncan style. I yeah, I don't consider him the MF or uh, get me the ball guy, excuse me, so the latter actually. I, I think I think he's, he's in between a little bit of that. Yeah. Yeah. I think Kevin Durant has gotten closer to the he's never gonna be the MF or but but I think Kevin Durant and again I know he's had some issues with the media this year, but I think he's still that nice guy off the court, but I think he's gotten a lot meaner on the court. And I think Anthony Davis, it's the same thing. I mean, remember, too, Anthony Davis is a Chicago kid. But I still right. think he's got it in him. Uh, I just think he's deferred his whole life. He wasn't that good, guys. I mean, he, he was not right. very good until after his junior year of, of AAU ball. And even his you know, right. first half of the, the year at Kentucky, what did he do? He deferred. And then, right. the, you know, really well, the last third point. of the season was when he stepped out and started doing some things away from the bucket, which I knew he could do from watching him over the summers. So I, I think it's going to be a, a gradual transformation for him. But I think he, he's not going to be a killer. He's never going to be a, you know, Kobe or somebody like that in terms right. of having that alpha dog give me the ball and I'm going to run you over. But but right. I think you know, like Durant, as the seasons go along, I think he'll get a little bit little bit closer. Yeah, I, I agree. I I, I mean I, I I agree in that, and that's what he is now. And I hope that he grows like Durant, because a series like this series here, I think this might be the light bulb that goes off in his head. Like, oh wow, I can't always be the good teammate. Sometimes I got to be a little bit of a jerk uh, to make yeah, sure, you know, for us to have a chance to win. Yeah, it's not even selfish. It's just assert the hierarchy, the food chain, because sometimes you kind of get, oh, you know, we're all, you know, because I, I would argue that a guy like Rasheed Wallace never really progressed to that point. He never got to the point where, like, I'm the best son of a gun on the court, and I should be touching the ball every single time, and you guys but he was a knucklehead, I mean. He, he was, was a knucklehead. But, but, like... but beneath that, but beneath that also, Rasheed, like, if you talk to the guys who are around him, he wanted to be one of the guys. He did not want yeah. to be the alpha dog. You know, even if he was, if he didn't have the technical fouls and and the histrionics on the court, he didn't want to be like he could have been better than Timmy and better than KD. A lot of people say this that you know people were around and that they even I think Tim Duncan said it before. Like Rasheed Wallace should be the best power forward in the NBA. This was years ago, obviously, but you know there's just that thing. It's like I just want to show up to work and do what I'm told and fit in. I don't want to be the guy who kind of sometimes has to go off script because it's my team. Well, listen, I, I just think overall it's just good for the league because I, I think we can all agree this is a league that markets its stars as well as any sport, I think. And this guy is going to be a star. And I think that you need him to become a household name if he's going to become the best player in the league, which I think will happen the next three, four, maybe even five years. But I, I think that's even... Uh, I think I'm being maybe even a little too courteous to LeBron in that situation when I'm talking even five years. So, are we gonna should we give it a give a series a, a stamp right here? What, what, are, what are you going over and four? Oh, you, you, want, you want a prediction on this series? Why not? Why it not? This is unofficial. Four. Okay, is uh, my prediction. You just yeah. mentioned Clubber Lang earlier. Pain. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah, man, this thing is a four or five game series, tops, for Golden oh, State. Oh, man, I, I don't even, I, you know, I've been trying to convince myself that New Orleans is going to win one, and the more I think about it, the more I'm like, there's not even a shadow of a doubt that this is going to go four, four in, four out, really good. You know, you saw, by the way, you guys saw what happened. So they won their game uh, last night against San Antonio. They get in the huddle. And somebody in the huddle says, all right, now let's get ready for the scrimmage. Referring to, of course, uh, yeah. Draymond yeah. Green, when the uh, Warriors played New Orleans about a week ago or so, Draymond Green is in the locker room joking around and says, come on, guys, let's get this scrimmage over with. So apparently, Andrew Bogut heard the comment, and he, and he, I don't know, he had this long quote that I read yesterday. And he basically said, it was a joke that Draymond made in the locker room, and the ball boy was there, and he was laughing too. Well, then he turned around and ran over to the other locker room and told them what they were saying. And Andrew Vogel said, and that's why we won't have any ball boys in our locker room this time around when we go down to New Orleans. <laughs> so this is, right. they're, the Warriors, are, they're, they're a little annoyed at that 
whole circumstance. And that's why I think, like, I was at first I was, you know what, New Orleans could win a game. And then when I heard, you know, these guys are basically, they're out for blood, yeah, it's going to be a sweep. Yeah, it's four or five games, I think, tops. I don't think it's going to be five games. <laughs> I really don't. I really don't. You know, Maybe if Tyreek goes think about, 40. Yeah. I mean, hey, I guess anything can happen. <laughs> so, by the way, I know we want to talk about uh, uh, one of the topics we're going to get into today is who has maybe the easiest path to the finals. I'll tell you this, the worst draw by far has to be the Clippers, right? Like, you're looking at yourself, oh, you're like, man. what? What? What do you mean we got to play the Spurs in round one? What the hell did we get the three seed for? <laughs> they got to be furious with New Orleans. <laughs> I sincerely, I sincerely felt bad for the Clippers. Because they had a season, they had, I mean, they had their own share of turmoil this season. And yeah. all they needed was San Antonio to win a game that they, that they were supposed to win. Hello, Spurs. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to want to be the two seed. You're supposed to want to avoid, you know. And instead, the Spurs dropped that game. And now the Clippers are like, really? Really? Now we got to deal with this? And as uh, one of my followers last night tweeted, he said, hey, I think Popovich just started intentionally fouling DeAndre Jordan, like right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel terrible for the Clippers because they were, you and I talked about this, I mean, the other day when I was in for Cowherd, they're kind of like, uh, you know, look, the Warriors and the Spurs were the two teams to beat in the Western Conference, um, and they're still on that same trajectory to meet each other in the conference finals, so at least that's good, I think, for the NBA fan. But... You know, the Clippers were kind of like that real dark horse team. Like, okay, if things kind of broke their way and they got a bounce here, maybe even an injury, maybe they could get into the finals because their top six guys in the rotation are elite. And then even though the bench is not very good. But now forget it. They're done. Like, they're done. This is a series that I don't Can they win more than two games? Can they push it to seven? On the one hand, I think we're really underestimating the Clippers. This is a team that was – First in offensive efficiency, thanks to that mm -hmm. drubbing in Phoenix. You know, I, I know the Warriors are like, come on, sons, put up a little bit more of a fight than that. But this is the best offensive team by the numbers in the NBA. They have yeah, probably the best four, I believe, was their offensive yeah. efficiency. Yeah, the best, the best point guard in the NBA in terms of fulfilling the duties of that role. Blake Griffin's pretty good. DeAndre Jordan is, is a force to be reckoned with on the boards and as a shot blocker. Matt Barnes has had a, a great season defensively when he looked a little worn down early. J.J. Redick has, has really come on down the stretch. Jamal Crawford is one of the best six men. So when you stop at six, you're like, this is a really good team. And in the playoffs with the rotation shortened, does it matter that Austin Rivers is only going to play seven or eight minutes and Glenn Davis is going to play eight or nine minutes? It might not matter. But at the same time, I kind of feel like we have to give deference to the Spurs. I, I guess, you know, a long story short, I feel like this is going to be the Spurs-Dallas series from last year, the team that very well could beat them, but I think the Spurs will, will you know, end up winning at the end. You know, I think if you, if you actually look at the talent and compare it with the Clippers in San Antonio, it's not that far off, but... We're, we're going to all look at it and say, well, what's the difference? San Antonio, they win. They're used to winning. They have won, so they're going to win this series. And, and I mean, you're at Chris Paul's. If you want anybody with the ball, you want it in Chris Paul's hands. Blake Griffin's gotten better uh, after kind of a slow start out of the gates. And as I mean said, they've got players. They've got a shooter in Redick. They've got a great sixth man in Crawford, uh, a defensive presence in DeAndre Jordan. Uh, but ultimately, when it comes down to it, you're not betting against Tim Duncan and Ginobili and Parker and, and Kawhi Leonard and even Danny Green, who just has a propensity to make shots in clutch time. So, you know, I, I feel that if the Clippers can somehow get past San Antonio, they can get some momentum, and I think they win the next series against Houston or Dallas. I, I think almost you flip it and you say, all right, unfortunately the Clippers have to play San, San Antonio in the first round. Uh, and if you flipped it and said, well, give them Houston in the first round, they'd much rather that. I mean, not even close. Yeah, no, I, I'm with you on that. Uh, I, I would agree. Um, I, I think that ultimately, though, the NBA fan is going to get what they want, right? Because I think we all want to see San Antonio, Golden State in the conference finals. And I think that 
at least right now, based on where everyone looks, how everyone looks right now, and their health status, I think that's kind of what we're going to get here, right? I mean, I think the Warriors piece of the puzzle, maybe I'm jumping ahead to our next conversation, but the Warriors part of the puzzle, is, it looks pretty straightforward. The Spurs, man, I, I, I don't know, man. I, like, I just think that it's not cut and dry. If you ask me to pick, I would pick the Spurs, but I think the Clippers are going to be a tough series for them. They win that one. They have to play the winner of Houston and Dallas. They always have problems with Dallas, and, uh, you know, Houston's been, been good all year. I'm still taking Warriors Spurs in the conference finals. I'm glad they ended up on op- to the bracket, so we, we get that at the, you know, in the conference finals, but... I just, I, you told me to bet my mortgage. I don't know if I bet my mortgage that, that the Spurs are going to make it all the way through. See, I, I don't know about like, if it's Houston. I'm not as worried for the Spurs. Um, I, I just think Kawhi. You put Kawhi and James Harden, and that's it. And that that's the series right there, in my opinion, especially the way he's playing right now. So, right. If it's Houston, I, I like the Spurs' chances, and I just don't think the Clippers are good enough to beat them. Like they're just not like I. They're defensively, they're kind of they're middle of the road. I think they're 15th in defensive efficiency, actually. So they're literally right in the middle of the road. Um, and San Antonio, man, they, it just feels like they've had their number uh, as well the last couple of years. Kind of like they've had the Grizzlies numbers uh, or number. I, I think that San Antonio has that feel with the Clippers. So I know Dallas gives them trouble, but this isn't the same Dallas team we've seen. You remember last year, and correct me if I'm wrong here. But I recall a lot of Sean Marion at the, you know, guarding Tony Parker. That was kind of unconventional. Um, you know, I thought Rick right. Carlo did a really good job at throwing different things at Parker. And they don't have those guys anymore that I think they can do that with. I mean, is Rondo that guy at this stage of his career if they end up meeting in round two? Heck no. You know, we talked about Golden State and New Orleans. It's interesting because yeah. Anthony Davis is in it. Portland, Memphis, I mean, it could go either way. You know, Clippers, San Antonio, yeah, 95% of the world is going to say San Antonio comes up on top. But it, it, you still have Chris Paul and, and Blake Griffin on the other side. And, and Houston, Dallas, that's, that's the one I honestly think could be the biggest lopsided, other than Golden State, New Orleans, of course. Like, if Chandler Parsons isn't healthy, is Dallas really going to – I don't know. I mean, I – I just don't see them giving Houston much of a fight. Yeah, I'm with you on that. If, if, if Parsons isn't healthy, uh, I just don't see them. I know Monte can have a game, obviously, but Dirk is slowing down a little bit. Tyson Chandler is not the defensive player he's been in years past. they got to guard Monte Ellis, though. That's, I mean, right. I think that's, no, that's Monte a... can, can have a game, but do you, yeah. do you feel like Monte can carry you for a series? I'm willing to bet that Carlisle finds a way to make them, even though they're not what they were defensively in years past, that Carlisle finds a way to make them um, at least capable on that end. Right, because, because I think that, that's another thing I think people, when you look at a team's defensive rating, you've got to understand it's an average. It's an average of all the games you've played. So there are some games where you have to guard a certain way. There are some games you have to guard a different way. And so... Even though we can surmise that in general they're not a good defensive team, if you give that coaching staff enough time to sit down and game plan and basically say, okay, this is how we're going to stop the things that you like to do, you know, that's a lot easier to be good in that shorter sure. time span defensively than mm-hmm. it is over a course of an 82 game season when you have limited prep time and travel and all that stuff. Yeah. So in that yeah. sense, I know the, the Mavericks aren't good defensively. But I do wonder, so if you give those guys two, three days to sit down and drop a game plan and then go in there in game one, game one's over, and then make adjustments on that game plan based on what happened in game one. They play Saturday. I, I think, they, yeah, okay, so, so they, had, they basically had two days, two and a half days uh, of prep time. So, um, you know, given that much time, and then as I said, after you play game one, you go make adjustments, and so you go into game two, uh, with little tweaks in, here and there. I mean, in the span of a uh, best of seven, they may be good enough defensively. They may be good enough. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I, I, I you know, Carlisle can make them capable. Uh, and I think that, that that kind of is the one reason I would say to myself, okay, uh, if Parsons is healthy, um, and, right. and obviously I think I give him the edge. I don't think there's any question if we're talking about McHale and, and Carlisle. 
uh, the coaching edge goes to Dallas. So if Parsons is healthy, and because they've got the coaching edge, I will give them a chance to win that series. Um, but if Parsons is still dinged up, then I don't think they have much of a chance because even Carlisle, I, I think, can um, will, is not enough to overcome uh, James Harden and, and a, what we seem to think is going to be a, a healthy Dwight Howard here moving forward. And by the way, Houston's defense is good now. Like they've been good this year. Like, yeah, I, no, I, I don't know about you, I but I think they've been pretty good on defense. Uh, I think so too. But but we have to recognize that Patrick Beverly is now walking through that door, and I think that was that's true. That was you know what? Good point. Good point. You know, good point. Like if, if Beverly were healthy, I'd be like, yeah, no problem, because he I, he he'll at least make Monte's life miserable. Monte yeah. still may get 25 or so, but it'll make it like, oh, my God, God you know, every time you step on the floor, because the guy's a nuisance. But without him, if you're telling me they're going to stick Prigioni or or uh, or Jason Terry or or right. even if you take one of those bigger guys like Corey Brewer, I just don't think, like, Monte Ellis, he shred those guys, man. You know what? You kind of talked me into maybe thinking Dallas has a real chance. Maybe. I, I, I mean, but I'm again, a, I still without Parsons' my pick. health. I still haven't made my picks yet. To be honest, I still haven't made my picks. I think Chandler Parsons' health, absolutely, you're right there. Because they need, yeah, they Jeff can't, they can't be the Montel yeah. issue. Yep. Right. Right. Okay, um, so who do you think has the easiest path to the finals? Uh, and I'm going to start here. Uh, and I know, and this is this is a tough one because I think that they're obviously dinged up. I mean, you and I talked about this uh, in the last week or so as well, I think, on radio, which is the injury to Cephalosha hurts because Damari Carroll, if they get if, if they end up playing Cleveland, Atlanta in the in the conference finals, he'll get the main assignment on LeBron. But you need a secondary guy to make LeBron work. Um, so that hurts a little bit. Millsap's shoulder injury, I don't know the severity of it. They seem they seem to think it's not a big deal. Uh, I'd like to see what it looks like before making a pick. But just on paper, on paper, they've got the easiest path to the finals, I think, because they really only have to play one team that I would fear, which is Cleveland. Because they're going to, I think they're going to beat Brooklyn. I think they're going to beat Toronto. And then they just got Cleveland. I like how Dr. Serrano needs to, not Dr. Sedano needs to see the, uh, the MRI. But I'd like to I see do that show. The MRI. MRI. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Hey, I did interview uh, Neil Patrick Harris once, so I I, I have six oh. degrees of separation of Doogie Howser. Nice, nice. I just uh, I just watched a million ways to die in the West. He was in that. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, he was in that. Um, so yeah, like I think Atlanta only has one real team they have to get through to get to the finals. In my opinion, one team that I would be fearful of. Yeah. Yes. And and yet, and yet I kind of feel like the Warriors still got it. Because the Pelicans, really? we've, we've acknowledged, yeah, because the Pelicans mm-hmm. are going to be, there's going to be light work. And in the second round is Memphis versus Portland, which is basically the battle of two teams who are very injured. And, yeah. you know, we saw what happened when the Warriors for, played both of those teams recently. Um, I, I just, I don't see that being a struggle. Now, San Antonio, if they get to the conference finals, that's a struggle. But there's at least a chance that San Antonio won't make it to the conference finals because they've got a pretty tough path. Meanwhile, East, you, you can still – we still expect Cleveland, obviously, going to annihilate Boston. My, sure. Apologies to my friends in Beantown. Uh, and then in the second round, they see Chicago versus – oh, so Chicago, Milwaukee. I, I guess Cleveland do, – do you think there's any chance Cleveland loses to Chicago? Let me put it that way. No, I don't think there's any chance, but I think it makes it, they make it a, a tougher series than Toronto would yeah. potentially, oh, yeah. um, which is my guess who would come out of this second round series to play Atlanta. Um, yeah, yeah, my guess is that because or Washington, whomever, regardless, one of those two right. teams. I think Atlanta can beat both those teams. So yeah, that's the reason because I think Chicago is a tougher matchup than Toronto or Washington. It's yeah, it's yeah. You're right. You're right. I. I, I I think the Cephalosha thing has really, really been understated. I've been trying to get that point across on Sports Center, on the radio, whenever on this podcast, but I, I just don't get the feeling that the general public because they look at his averages and say six points, four rebounds, big whoop, and they just don't understand. You know, defensively, this guy's amazing. Uh, like you said, you need multiple bodies in general to guard LeBron, and no offense to Kent Bazemore, you need you need guys with a little bit more a veteran. Uh, savvy and, and experienced, but B also, when we get to the playoffs, it's a reputation game here. So 
Yeah. Chavo is going to be able to, or would be able to do things that Kent Bazemore can't, not because he's physically incapable, because refs are going to be like, you're Kent Bazemore, of course that's a foul. Blow the whistle. Yeah. So um, th- those, are, those are things that I worry about. But more than that, offensively, um, he's good for about one pick and roll, pick and roll a game, and he's really, like, great things happen out of it. And having another guy who can handle the ball and create off the dribble outside of the point guard, I think that's really important for this team because many of their guys aren't those type of players. They're kind of uh, pass and cut type players, and so you kind of need that secondary guy out there. Jeff, who do you think has the easiest, easiest path to the finals? Yeah, I mean, I, I would go 1A, the Hawks, as you said, and, and probably, you know, 1B, I'd go Cleveland. You know, it's got to be somebody in the East to me. Someone in the East, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's what I was thinking, actually, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, either one. I think Atlanta, certainly you look at it and you say, you know, you know, I mean, he was saying, well, New Orleans is going to be a cakewalk. Well, I think Brooklyn's just as much of a cakewalk in, yes, in round one. And then, uh, you know, Toronto, Washington. Now, again, I've never been a huge, huge believer here in Atlanta. Even when we were doing a podcast in the middle of the year, they had it rolling. They won like 8,000 in a row. I still wasn't ready to buy Atlanta as this team that can win it all. And, you know, again, I'm still not. Uh, I think Cleveland, it just depends on the Chicago team that they get. You know, they, they're just not healthy. Noah's not health. I mean, listen, Tibbs has no. kind of run down that whole that whole team. At one point or another, everybody's been hurting that whole roster, I think. So what Chicago Bulls team are you going to get when they play Cleveland? How healthy are they going to be? Uh, I don't think they're anything close to 100%. All right. Let's, uh, we're we're going to get into some of the coaching stuff. You mentioned Tibbs because there's uh, obviously the talk that he may not be around much longer. So we want to get into that in just a sec. But first, um, Quick on your MVP. Uh, just uh, we we we've made all made our cases here over the last couple of weeks, in, you know, on Twitter or on this podcast or somewhere. Um, so I'm going Steph Curry. What about you, Jeff? Yeah, I'm doing the same. Best player, best team. Uh, Steph Curry. I don't know. I <laughs> part of it I got to say I won't lie. When it comes down to it, I, I think Steph Curry has better intangibles too. And, and if it's close. I'm going with a guy who's got better intangibles. I know Harden's gotten better on the defensive end. Uh, he passes it better than he ever has. I just think Curry is like the ultimate team guy. I mean, yeah, I, 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 I have Curry one, Harden two. Davis has jumped up to three for me. He got the Pelicans to the playoffs. That, that's amazing. Uh, yeah. Four would be Westbrook and five, uh, LeBron James. Yeah, I got those same five in that order too, so. All right, what we're going to do is we're going to take a break here. We'll be back in 60 seconds, and we're going to discuss what could be the potential of the coaching carousel and a new rumor out there about a college coach that may may or may not actually make the jump to the NBA. We'll get to that next year on the NBA Lockdown Podcast. Geico presents Strange Saving Stories. Astronomers detected an interstellar transmission. It stated, Geico, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. The implications were staggering. Was the cosmos telling us we could all save hundreds on car insurance with Geico? Or did their radar merely pick up a signal from the nearby Rufus and Clyde's morning show? We may never know. Geico, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Welcome back to the NBA Lockdown Podcast alongside Amin El Hassan and Jeff Goodman. I'm George Sedano. All right, guys, so we've got uh, a story out there today that says that Billy Donovan could be back in the NBA. When I say back, I think he was with the Orlando Magic for like seven minutes uh, before he decided to go back to the University of Florida. Uh, he has a relationship with Sam Presti. Um, Jeff, you would know this as well as any of us. Uh, what do you make of that possibility? Do you think it makes sense or no? You know, here, here's the thing I, I kind of go back to, a couple couple deals. Now, one, the relationship he has with Sam Presti, as you mentioned. Uh, Sam Presti hired Billy Donovan's not an assistant coach, but the assistant to the head coach, which means he was not on the road recruiting. He's a young kid who came. He was an assistant at Holy Cross uh, named Mark Dagnall, and he hired him. This past, a year ago, to run his D-League team. Um, so there is a relationship there. There is a level of respect. 
Uh, obviously, it's going to depend if Scott Brooks makes it through the year. If he does, there's a couple issues at play here. Uh, Billy Donovan never took Kentucky when Cal Perry, well, two different occasions Billy Donovan was offered Kentucky. One, uh, when Billy Gillespie took it. Two, when Cal Perry took it. And I'm told one of the primary reasons was his wife didn't want to move to Lexington. And Billy Donovan doesn't want to be in a fishbowl like Lexington. Uh, now, he did the dance with the Magic years ago. Uh, that kind of uh, that deal has been expired now. Uh, he's allowed to coach back in the NBA if he so chooses. Um, you know, I don't know which way it's going to go. He, he does not have a great team coming back in Florida. They did not make any postseason this year. So certainly he's frustrated uh, with that. It's just... I don't know if he moves to Oklahoma City with his wife. I don't know if he goes to a Thunder organization that may not have, you know, its two stars, Kevin Durant and Russell Westbrook, in two years. I think Orlando is another option. But with that one, it does the same ownership where Billy Donovan did the dance and decided to go back to college. Did they take another shot with Billy Donovan? No. And then they look terrible. No. I mean, what if no. they go knee no. deep again? And he says no. Here's the thing. The first thing I'd say is, is for all the criticisms that we've levied and many have levied against Scott Brooks over the years, mm -hmm. it's under, he's a 60-win coach when his guys are healthy. First of all, now, let's take a look at those criticisms. And, and bearing in mind those criticisms, if you are, if they have pushed you to the point where they say, Scotty, thank you, but we have to go a separate direction, you're telling me Billy Donovan is your pick? To, like, how is that the solution? Oh, yeah, we run a terrible offense that doesn't really, you know, exploit the talents of our, our best players. Bring me Billy Donovan. Like, that does not make sense to me. I'm sorry, man. I, I, I don't look at Billy Donovan as this offensive whiz kid. Or, or, and, and, you know, more importantly, does Billy Donovan have the bedside manner to well, that's the question. coach that's the question. NBA players? He's He's run ball screen for years. Like, he's been ahead in the college game. He's actually been furthest to the NBA game in terms of what he's run for years. So, like, I think that part he'd be okay with. I think he's a heck of a coach, okay? But I'm, I'm with you with a bedside manner. Like, to me, and not that Billy Donovan's got a huge ego. Uh, like, he's not Cal Perry in that regard. But he's also not Brad Stevens. He's not Fred Hoiberg. Uh, he's not some of the great NBA coaches that understand that it's not about you. It's all about the players. And Billy Donovan is not the most patient person. He hasn't been since they won the two NBA t uh, two college titles uh, in a row with Horford, Noah, and, and Corey Brewer. Uh, remember, Chandler Parsons was kind of his whipping boy for the first couple of years in Gainesville. You know, because that group, Calathus and Parsons, came right after the Hortford Noah group. So the expectations yeah. for Donovan were so high. So I don't know how well, you know, I said that about Izzo too when we were talking about Izzo the Cavs a few years ago. Some of these college guys, only because the program has been all about them, they're the face, I think it's hard for them to go in the NBA and, and flip the switch and be, well, it's all about the players. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. I mean, just the natural human reaction, right, is that you're used to being glorified. You're used to almost being treated like a deity of sorts uh, yeah. around your campus and we're in, in the neighboring uh, surrounding areas. So, yeah, I, I mean, it's it's a big, big deal. And it's why, and, you know, we always hear, I, I've heard somebody, I forgot who it was uh, right now, that said something to the effect of, oh, well, the NBA is incestuous, and they want to keep college coaches out, and it's because it's not good for their business. They want to make sure to bring guys up through their own ranks. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I, I think it's just because the cultures are so different that you, it's not easy to make that transition. Um, and you're either a guy who is fit for the NBA or you're a guy who's not. And, look, that's not to say that coaches in the history of that league, of the NBA, um, haven't had huge egos. Uh <laughs> And look, I mean, we've seen Pat Riley and Phil Jackson, and you know, I mean, we, we've been around guys like that before. Like those yeah, guys, but, but those guys, alpha dogs those too. Guys, but the difference is, those guys won their rings early enough where they now right. have the the street cred to do it. And if you look at all of the successful young coaches in our league, they are all great communicators. 
They are all yeah. able to get their vision across without yelling, without screaming, without humiliation. Basically, the number, the top three things every college coach uses: yelling, screaming, and humiliation. So, again, yeah. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not one of those guys say, "Oh, college guys, coaches can't succeed on this level." But I think, as you guys have both mentioned, it takes a certain kind of guy. Brad Stevens is that kind of guy. I think Fred Hoiberg is that kind of guy. Billy Donovan. John Calipari, I don't think they're that kind of guy. You know who's got the personality? Um, you know who's got the personality? I don't know if he's got the offense to be able to do it, but Tony Bennett at Virginia has the demeanor absolutely to do it. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. I haven't been around him very much, but it just seems like he's just very affable. Um, yeah. You know, so, I mean, that, that does make some sense. By the way, man, yeah. I, I spent some years, you know, watching some Washington State basketball when Tony Bennett was up there. Man, let me tell you something. If he's gonna run that kind of offense in the NBA, he better have Can't like all. No, he no. gotta have like all slow dudes who don't want to run. He needs an run. offensive then, No, he, he <laughs> needs an offensive coordinator. Absolutely. <laughs> but I'm just saying, he, Mike and Tony's. That's Mike who works. Tony's right here. You know who works? <laughs> you know who who we haven't mentioned in Oklahoma City, and and I don't Who's think it would be the right hire. Higher. But it's Kevin Ollie. Only because of his relationship and the yeah. respect yeah. that Kevin he Durant has. has that yeah. maybe you roll the dice and say, you know what? All we care about, if we keep Kevin Durant here, we're still in business. If we don't, we're dead. Yeah. Right. Kevin Ollie is, is definitely in the gets it list. He's definitely got the demeanor and the approach. Uh, to, to be an NBA, a successful NBA coach. And he's not, by the way, it's not just Kevin Durant that respects Kevin Ollie because that dude got around. He Everybody played a does. lot of teams. Yeah. There's yeah. a Everybody lot does. of dudes in this league who look up to Kevin Ollie as a, as a kind of a, a sage advisor. Yeah, no, I would agree. That, that's definitely a good one. Um, are we seeing the last of Tibbs as the coach of Chicago? Like, do we think that's a done deal? Like, because there's always the rumors, or there have been some serious rumors about him and Orlando, first of all, let's start with the Chicago situation. Um, those guys aren't necessarily getting along, uh, but we've seen strained relationships continue for a time. It, it, has that time come? Has it expired here? Uh, you know, I, I hope not. That's what I've been saying this whole time. Uh, you know, a while ago I was talking with some people, uh, you know, in the league, and I was saying, ah, oh, you know, it's crazy, these crazy media rumors about Tibbs being out. Yeah, it's not going to happen. And they looked at me like, yes. And I was like, really? And, and, you know, apparently that's, everyone just thinks that that relationship is fractured. And it wouldn't be the first time that happened in Chicago. I was actually on Chicago radio the other day, and I brought it up. And the guys were like, well, no, that was, that was mutual. Phil didn't want to come back. I said, exactly. This is mutual, too. Tibbs doesn't want to come back, I don't think. Not the way they, they've handled him. And they don't want him back because he's uncontrollable, sound familiar. This is the same thing that happened to Phil Jackson a couple of decades ago. The difference is obviously Tibbs doesn't have six rings to, to kind of lean back on. But still, he, I think he's regarded as one of the better coaches in the game as far as at least from an X's and O's standpoint. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I wish it weren't the case, but... I don't see a scenario where he's back next year, um, even if they win a championship, as crazy as that might sound. Yeah, I, you know, I, I don't, don't think they're winning a championship, so we don't have to worry about that part. Yeah, of I don't either. I think. Okay. Go ahead, Jeff. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I don't think it's just Gar Foreman and Paxson with Tibbs either. I mean, I think it's the players. Like, he, he's not a good communicator. You know, I've talked to plenty of players off the record in that locker room. And they just kind of tune them out. Now, I know that's the case with a lot of coaches around the league. I'm sure it's the case yeah. with you know, Carlisle yeah. in Dallas and probably, you know, ten other guys. Uh, but, again, like we talked about, the new age coaches these days is the Brad Stevenses, is, you know, guys like that, Doc Rivers, you know, who can be tough on young players right. but still kind of gets it and has the respect because why? He played. What is T Tibbs has a respect because he's so prepared, but but when you wear down everybody uh, and you don't have good communication skills, the first sign of not winning at the highest level, that's usually when it kind of goes downward, spiral, and, and and then something happens. So 
you know, well, I agree. Everything I've heard, you know, is that most people feel like he will not be the coach there, almost no matter what next year. And, and if that's the well, case, the, go ahead. Look, no, 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 go ahead. Finish. finish sorry. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, if that's the case, I mean, honestly, I and I've said this. People have asked me this for the last, you know, while I was in the Final Four in Indy, over and over, Billy Donovan going, Billy Donovan going, Billy Donovan going. And I'm saying, listen, I don't know about Billy Donovan, but if, if I'm betting my money, I'm betting more that Fred Hoiberg is with the Bulls than Billy Donovan is in the NBA next year somewhere. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm with you. I'm with you on that. Now, look at his tree, though. Look, and I, look, I know he coached under Doc for a while there in Boston. He was kind of their de facto defensive coordinator. But the tree for, for Tibbs is the Van Gundys, who come from Riley. And yeah. they have a history of writing guys. Like, that's what they do. Yep. Going back to Pat, yep. you know? I mean, Pat was the guy who developed that Old mantra. Yeah. yeah, Pat developed that mantra of, you know, when you go into the playoffs, you know, you play eight, you trust seven. You know? I mean, that's just kind of who he is. <laughs> um, so... <laughs> But, you know, and Tibbs takes that to the regular season. Um, you know, and, you know, you always heard about Pat's crazy practices back in the 80s and 90s and, you know, Alonzo Mourning, you know, running through a brick wall for guys. And, you know, as time went by, it was just harder for Pat to relate, uh, I think. And I remember during this whole – remember, obviously, 2010, there was the whole bump gate between LeBron and Spolstra, and there was thought that, you know, is LeBron trying to push Spolstra out when they were 9-8? and eight? And, you know, I, I remember being on the air in Miami saying, um, LeBron doesn't know what he's getting into. Like, he, if he wants Pat as the coach, that's going to be a disaster in a lot of ways because Pat is just old school. As great as he is as an executive and as great as he was as a coach, um, you know, him and Shaq butted heads. And, 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 you know, I know for a fact Dwayne was probably telling him at the time, dude, you don't want it. Trust me when I tell you, you, you don't want this. I've been through this, okay? Um, and so Tibbs comes from that. He comes from the Van Gundys. And Stan has admitted, I, I mean, I've heard him on the Levitard show when he used to sit in every week for a stretch, um, how he talked about how, you know, in retrospect, you know, he's, he's learned that at times he can be, a bit abrasive and in guys' faces too much. And he's trying, he's tried to kind of learn from that experience. So Jeff is kind of the same way. And so what's to expect? You are what your environment is, is kind of the way I look at it. And yes, he had a couple of years under Doc who handles things a little differently. Um, but I think that generally that, that shouldn't be a surprise that Tibbs is who he no. is based on who he's learned from. Yeah. Yeah. No, th those years under Doc don't count because literally he's, He's his own. He's on an island. That's how Tibbs is, by the way. He goes in there. Mm -hmm. He doesn't really interact with everybody else. And Doc and those guys handle the, the glad handing and back slap and all that stuff. But Tibbs is Tibbs is Tibbs. He gets in at 6 a.m. and he watches film and he doesn't have a life and he doesn't ha and he's not married and he doesn't have kids and he doesn't watch movies and he, like that's who he is. And again, uh, you know the interesting thing that uh, Jeff that you brought up is that guys tune out coaches after a while first of all that's that's true across the league but more importantly guys can sense guys a lot of them can sense when the organization isn't lockstep with a guy yeah, so right. in in so in the example of lebron and spo lebron thought he could throw his weight around and we'd get this guy out, up out of here right but when it the organization top right. to bottom was like no no spo's the guy what does LeBron do? Like, oh, I guess he was a guy. And, and, and we never heard anything of it again, um, right. or at least not that overt. As a well, they won 21 of 22, I think, some, after that, or somewhere like that. But even I know in December, even years <laughs> down. that kind of helped the <laughs> cause, too. <laughs> right. In December, they won but, 21 but, of 22. <laughs> but he doesn't, buy, he doesn't buy in, I don't think, if he gets the feeling that, oh, if I just sure. Agree. do this, he'll be out. Agreed. And so... Those guys in the locker room, yeah, part of it is they're tired of listening to Tibbs, but part of it is they read the papers too, and they listen to podcasts, yeah. and, and they listen to the radio, and they see the friction or the at least the cold nature between the front office and the coaches. I'm like, oh, he, he's living on borrowed time himself. So, you mm -hmm. know, I don't have to run through a wall for this guy because, right. he, yeah. you know, he probably won't yeah. be here. And that's, a, by the way, that's a big reason why Oklahoma City 
has been so successful with Scott Brooks is because they are so lax at any time there's any, even like a smidgen of that kind of talk, they all did it, top to bottom. And that organizational culture, that's when it comes in so, so strongly. Well, there's the topic that, uh, or the discussion that Tibbs may end up in Orlando. Uh, what do we make of that particular fit? Jeff, we'll start with terrible. You. Oh, I think it would be absolutely abysmal. Really? With those young guys, really? oh, he would, seriously, Victor Oladipo and, and Gordon, Aaron Gordon, go too hard as it is. Like, oh, those yeah. guys oh, would be that? hurt all the time. Yes. In that sense, okay. Right. Yeah, I thought, no, I, I thought you meant like. And, and again, right. though, like, I just, Tibbs is a great X's and O's guy. He is, but like, you better have, and, and George and I were talking about this before, I think we got on. Like, you better have the right assistant with Tibbs that can connect mm -hmm. with if he takes Orlando with all those young dudes. Because if you don't, right. it, it's just not going to work. Dude. It's like, listen, it's like when I was, you know, 10 years old or 8 years old and, and my grandfather, who was a great guy, okay, but, like, we didn't have a lot. To, he was 75 years old. Like, we just didn't have a lot to talk about. <laughs> these kids don't get Tibbs. Tibbs doesn't get yeah. these kids. Yeah. Here, yeah. Here's, here's what I, I will beg to differ in the slightest. Part. I think, first of all, in Orlando, they've been really, they really haven't had a lot of direction under Jacques Vaughn and, and yeah. James Borrego, bless him, but, you know, when you're an interim, it's just hard to get that, that kind of people's attention. So I think Tibbs will come in, he get their attention quickly because they know his pedigree as a winning and, as a winner and all that. The other thing is, while I agree with you, eventually he'd wear them down. At first, at least, he'd get them, he'd get them on the right track. At first. Then after okay. a while. It usually takes a while because it's a young team. They don't, no, none of those guys are really, you know, are, are, They don't know any better. Kind of. <laughs> exactly. Well, you know what? Exactly. The like, one thing I will say, guys, <laughs> can I jump in? The one thing I will sure. say is you've got Oladipo who, fl who played for Tom Crean, who's a lunatic. And, <laughs> and you've got Gordon who played for Sean Miller, who's really, really tough. So. Right. Yeah, Tibbs may not be, it may not be quite the jump that it is for some guys. You know, some right. guys, but, but that's the way that Chicago, look at it. Like, Jimmy Butler played for Buzz Williams. He's crazy. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and, and Noah I, played I, for Donovan. Say, but this is, this is what I would say, though. I think when you have a young team, young players respond to that kind of coach, which is why the whole Billy Donovan Oklahoma City thing didn't make sense to me. It's like, you're not going to come in and keep, treat vets like that. Now, young players, because this, this is still new. This is their first time on the rodeo. So, as yeah. George said, they don't know any better. So, they, they, yeah. they'll take it, quote, unquote. And then as time goes by, like we saw in Chicago. So, at first, Noah, they, all those dudes were willing to go to a wall for Tibbs. But after a couple of years, like, yo, dude, you got to chill. Enough. Especially yeah. as I get older. I got friends who play on other teams. You know, yeah. I'm sure Noah talks to Al Horford. Yo, what's Bud like? Oh, Bud's cool, man. Like, oh what? Like, like you know, Corey, sure. what's what's Coach McHale like? Oh, Coach McHale's cool. Well, hold up now. Like all the guys I've yeah. played with who came in with me, they're they're not going through all this crazy stuff. They're getting practices off. They're going through five on zero work only on days off, or you know, or you know, or during practice. Why am I still practicing? Like we're playing, we're getting ready for the Final Four, and yeah. so that's where that part is. So, Tibbs going down there, I think at first, because those kids don't know any better, they're still young. As you said, yeah. many of them have played for those type of coaches. They'll, they'd be more receptive at first until they start getting good. And, I'll buy that. And no, you're right. Them. You're right. I'll give you that. Who? Uh, what? Real quick, I mean, any thoughts, and Jeff, any thoughts on any other potential openings? Like, do we expect a lot of openings this year, you think, I mean? Oof, I don't like speculating. I really don't like speculating. Well, let's let's take a. I'm talking about like the non-playoff teams. How about that? Uh, okay, the non-playoff teams. All right, so let's start. Okay, let, we can just go run through them real quick. Look, yeah, Miami. Like, no, uh, not, that's not changing. Charlotte. I don't think so. But I think I don't think so. I think he's done a good enough job, and I think it's personnel driven why they didn't make the playoffs this year. Correct. I mean, Stan's not going anywhere. He's the damn president. <laughs> so Detroit is fine. Orlando, obviously, we just discussed. Philly, I don't think so. Uh, the Knicks, I don't think so either. Uh, Oklahoma City, we just discussed. Phoenix, Hornacek, do you think he's done a good enough job? No, oh, he's fine. I, I think he I, has. I think he's fine. I don't know. I, no, I don't know if he's fine. I don't know if those guys. Look, really? let me tell you something. Those guys over there, they're a bunch of finger pointers. 
There are a bunch of finger pointers over there in that organization. So they they're going to try and look. They hired him, and you know what? Someone's got to no. take the blame for not getting this. They're going to say things like, you didn't get the He overachieved line. last year. Yeah. He, hey, overachieved. You're, preaching to the, you're preaching to the choir. I'm not telling you my opinion on Coach yeah. Hornacek. I think he's done a phenomenal job. Great he job. deserves an extension. But Agreed. guess what? They've got, a, they've got a team option on his third year. They still haven't picked it up. And everything that they've done up till now, whenever things go wrong, how many times do they say, this was our bad, and how many times do they say, oh, it's because this guy was selfish, or this guy was this, or this guy was that. We've seen it several times. They, on players that are still on that team, mind you. Now, I'm not just talking about guys who got traded this, this off season, or I mean this uh, during the season. On players on that, Gerald Green, they've run a little, like, uh, a little campaign about, like, yeah, Gerald's this and Gerald's that. So... I'm not saying that Coach Hornacek is, deserves to be in trouble. I think he deserves an extension. He's done a phenomenal – that whole staff has done a phenomenal job. But much like Goran Dragic, I don't trust those guys over there. <laughs> All right, Utah, Snyder, he's safe, right? I would say so. I think he's, he's done a great job, particularly in the second half of the season, huh, as soon as they yeah. got rid of Cantor. Um, yeah, he's very safe to me. I still can't believe Quinn Snyder is an NBA head coach. <laughs> hey, <man>. Reinvention. <laughs> hey, by the way, he's he's uh by the way he's he might be the uh, oh and then again he does have a young team. I take that back. I was gonna say he might be an exception to that rule because he, he's an Crazy. intense kind of dude as well. Yeah, he is. But yeah. he has a young team and they haven't had a lot of success, so I'm sure they they are uh, you know starved for that kind of attention. We'll see how it goes in the next few years. Guys, yeah. how, uh, how long? I, I want to ask you this real quick before you get going, George, on this, but. How long does the George Carl DeMarcus Cousins marriage last? What's the over-under? Not long. I, I think that I, I mean, Co George is staying. I, I, I think it's just an opinion. I don't know anything. I think DeMarcus Cousins is totally on the block to be traded this offseason. Man, let me tell you something. First of all, Coach Carl, this is what I said, man. Don't take that job. <laughs> but but if, if, if I, I agree with you guys. I think part of the reason we had a front office switch beyond the fact that the owner is out of his mind. The other part of the reason is I think they needed a new voice in there to basically say, we got to move in a different direction with, with regards yeah. to this dude. And so uh, I think he's out. Yeah, I think DeMarcus is out. So Byron is staying with Los Angeles, right? Like we don't expect him to go anywhere, not right now. <laughs> no, not, not um, until the tank is complete. <laughs> and then uh, Flip isn't going anywhere. He's the president too. I mean, maybe he yeah, put yeah. someone else in there, but I don't. I don't expect no. that to be the case, unless he just gets bored and coaching. He just went through the he's tough. Not year. only the client. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. He's, 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 you got an opposite, George. You're supposed to get somebody else this year, and then yeah. <laughs> you're supposed to get somebody else this year, and then you come in like when everything is you right. Know, right. He screwed you, up. Like, Stan handle. Right. Stan handle. And Pop, the, the Pop market. did it too, right? Pop, Pop too, did it too. Yeah. Uh, Hey, Bob, he hey, Bob Hill. Hill. I got it from here. Bob Hill? Yeah. I got it from here. I got it from here. You need to sit this one out, Slugger. <laughs> so Denver is going to – they have an opening. Um, I might be the only guy still in the media that's going to cape – and cape is probably even a strong word uh, – that would love to see Mike D'Antoni back in the league. And I think that – I don't know what that roster is going to look like moving forward, but I feel like having had a lot of conversations with George Carl – that the way to play in Denver is run, 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 yes. run, get people gassed in that, in that environment. And, God, it just makes sense to me, Mike D'Antoni in Denver, potentially. But, uh, but I just think he got a raw deal in the sense that Los Angeles, we see that there's some turmoil up top. And in the Knicks, like, we know that. Like, I don't think he's a bad coach. Like, he's being labeled in some circles no. as a bad coach, and I don't think that's the case. Hey. Let me be the first to say anyone who calls Mike D'Antoni a, a bad coach is a dumb person who doesn't watch basketball. Because, again, every time you say, I love the way the Spurs play, I love the way the Clippers play, I love the way the Warriors play, you're saying, I love the way Mike D'Antoni coaches. Basically, that's what you're saying. Yeah. So that's first right. and foremost. Second of, all, second of all, I agree with you. An up-tempo pace in Denver is definitely what's needed. Um, but uh, Mike D'Antoni and, and Mike D'Antoni would be a great name there. A great name there. Like George Carl, I feel like he's above that job. I think he, he should be up for a better job, even though they're not really available right now. But Mike D'Antoni would be a great name. Alvin Gentry would be a great name. But 
I'll, I'll be honest. You know who I'm going to cape for for this job? Huh. The guy who has it right now, Melvin Hunt. He's, he's done a good he's job. A, yeah. He's done a good job. He's paid his dues. He's been in this league a while as a, as a respected lead assistant. Um, and, and he ha he has the ear of those players in that locker room. And, uh, and and I think, you know, he managed to get enough out of them over the second half of the season to at least warrant giving him a little bit of time. Let's see what he can do with a full training camp, uh, full off season, et cetera. Well, at least they weren't going one, two, three, six weeks or five weeks or four yes. weeks or three weeks yeah. as it was winding <laughs> down. <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> what do you Absolutely. think of D'Antoni, Jeff? Like, do you think he deserves another shot? I think so. Obviously, I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I think obviously his styles, like I mean said, a lot of people have kind of copied some degree his style in the NBA and in college as well. And um, you know, I, I don't know if Denver is the right spot for him though. I mean, that roster is is just mediocre to me. I mean, it just yeah. screams mediocrity looking at their roster. That's true. And I'm not sure how it gets better. You know, like, I like Ty Lawson. Like you guys said, like, push the ball. With Ty Lawson, you have to play that way in that in that atmosphere. Uh, with Lawson, you've got to play that way. But is Lawson the guy you want to build your franchise around? I'm not sure. You know, they just yeah. they don't have any players. they got just average players all the way up and down the roster. So if I'm Mike D'Antoni, there's no way i take that job. All right, that'll do it for the NBA Lockdown Podcast, our playoff preview edition with a little coaching carousel thrown in there as well. Jeff, Amin, thank you guys for stopping by. You got it. Can't wait. Can't wait for the playoffs. Playoffs? Yep, Sat. Kind of it, 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 it all begins on Saturday. You guys enjoy the games, and we'll talk to you next week. Take care. Have a great weekend. Thanks for listening to NBA Lockdown on ESPN Radio. For more great podcasts, check out the Pod Center page on ESPNRadio.com.